Be with those who are not able to be here for one reason or another today, and we pray that you will bless them, raise them up if they are ill, keep them safe if they are traveling, whatever the need. We pray for those who are suffering, Father, uh, physical disability, emotional or spiritual despair for some reason or other. We pray that you will touch their hearts and their bodies, raise them up. Week by week, Father, we see answers to prayer, and then we see more uh, difficulty coming down the road. And Lord, we thank you for how you answer. We thank you for how you are always there. But Lord, help us to understand that uh, you have called us to a life of suffering, that that's part and parcel of what it means to be a believer in Christ, to suffer well. And so I pray that we will do that for the glory of our Lord and Savior. Pray especially for our missionaries, Lord, various places, various needs for encouragement, for financial support, for whatever. But Lord, these days we cannot help but remember especially the Losi family as they continue to wait for a heart transplant for their son. Pray that you'll continue to sustain Daniel as his condition worsens little by little. We pray that you will Father, undertake to keep him until the time is right. Lord, wherever this heart is going to come from, somebody's going to be bereaved. And we pray that you will already prepare. Lord, I don't know how you do that, but we just leave this in your hands and pray that, uh, Lord, your overriding providence, which is always for our good and for your glory, will once again prevail. We pray for that. Lord, we ask again that you will now... Hide the messenger and make the message clear through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Please uh, turn with me to the 13th chapter of Luke, beginning in verse uh, 10, is where we were reading from. And I can't tell. Is, am I on? I guess I'm on. Am I on? Can you hear the mic? I'll talk louder if not. I'm okay. All right. Um, in our study through Luke, Jesus has just finished, last week we saw him just finished a sermon that began clear back in chapter 12, verse 1. He finished with a parable of the fig tree, which emphasized that the only life that can lead to a true relationship with the God that we all need to have a relationship with before we leave this life, the only thing that can find favor with him is a life of fruitfulness. And the fruitfulness that he's looking for is the good deeds that are in keeping with repentance. So it has to be repentance at the center of our life, resulting in faith in him. Not that the works that are in keeping with repentance earn God's favor, cannot earn God's favor, but that the works show that the repentance is real. And so the two go together like hand and glove. Now, in verses 11 through 17, or actually 10 through 17, in this 13th chapter of Luke, we're going to find that Luke chooses to give us two real-life examples of each type of person. One who has fruit and one who does not. One who believes in Jesus and one who does not. One who is repentant and one who is not. One who is saved by grace and one who is condemned by legalism. Condemned by legalism. Now this is a, this is a critical comparison, beloved, because every person, everyone sitting here this morning is right now in one of those categories or the other. We're either under grace or we are living under legalism. One or the other is true of each one of us. And it is our response to the message of Christ that determines which one we are. And that makes all the difference eternally. Now in Colorado, we are uh, familiar with this thing that we call the Continental Divide, right? The Continental Divide, that imaginary line, that geographic line that separates 
rain such that rain that falls on the west side of it is going to eventually end up in the, in the Pacific Ocean somehow. And the rain that falls on the east side of it is going to end up in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean, one way or the other. And the amazing thing is, as incredible as it seems, the same drop of rain could literally fall, and if it just happens to hit right and splits, part of it goes one way and part of it goes the other way, even though it starts absolutely at the same place, it ends up in a totally different place at the end of the day. All determined by how it lands. And that's the message of the gospel, beloved. Two people, like the two people in this account that Luke gives us, two real people who went to synagogue one Saturday morning, just like we came to church this morning. They went there on the same Sabbath. They were two real people, and they met Jesus at that synagogue, but one of them has been in the last 2,000 years in heaven, and the other one has been the last 2,000 years in hell. All because of the decision they made. Beloved, decisions in this life have eternal consequences. They determine where we will end up. And even though we may start very close together, we could end up in far different places. Now, there's an interesting thing in this passage. People often contrast, people often contrast grace and law. I'm sure you've perhaps had Sunday school teaching or even sermons on this, and they contrast grace and law. But, but the real contrast is not between grace and law. Those guys are friends. The contrast is between grace and legalism. It's legalism that's the problem. The law is good. The Bible calls it a tutor. And it teaches us that the, that, that the law is what God has given us to help us understand our need of a Savior, to help us understand that our life does not measure up to the standards of God and that without repentance, and then the fruit that demonstrates the reality of the repentance, we are lost. But legalism is the wrong use of the law. Legalism is the attempt to use the law for a purpose it was never intended in order to try and get to God to try and do those works that the law demands so that I can gain favor with God, which the Bible is telling me I can never do no matter how hard I try. Instead, the law is intended to teach me that I need a Savior. We will see that legalism hates grace. Legalism is the refusal to accept grace. Legalism is us saying in the face of God, I will make it on my own. I do not need you when we desperately do. Now I hope as we look at this, I've called this a tale of two responses because that's exactly what we will see in this passage before we get done. I hope we will be driven to the cross of Jesus Christ to see once again there that, that, that there is mercy and grace there and that there is hope nowhere else. So today we're gonna look at grace and how that's demonstrated in this passage. Next week, legalism. So what characterized, because the, the woman is the one who's representative of, of grace. What about her characterizes grace? Because there's several things about grace that we can see from her life. The first one is, and it's an interesting way to start, but the first one is she's crooked. She's crooked. You can't hardly miss that, right, if you read the passage, but it's emphasized for a reason. She's crooked. Now, this is Jesus' last visit to a synagogue that Luke mentions. Doesn't mean he didn't go to any more, but in the book of Luke, we're not going to find him in a synagogue anymore. These places of opportunity that he's been to hundreds of them over the last two and a half years through the land of Palestine have become places of mounting opposition. Some are here simply to catch Jesus violating their rules of the Sabbath. That's the only reason they've even come on this day. He will shame them into silence at the end of the day. And we'll see that next week. But in the meantime, we're centering on this woman. And here she comes, she enters, she's late, perhaps because of her disability, right? Made it difficult for her to get around on time. 
Luke says in verse 11 there, second part of the verse, she was bent over. Literally, the term means bent double. She could not fully straighten herself. So she shuffles to her place, to the place to sit in the, in the synagogue with her eyes always on the ground. One commentator said that she walked about as if she were searching for a grave. That's what she would have looked like would have taken an, an act of intense effort, immense effort for her even to, to look up at all. And probably she would have had to do that only by turning sideways. She's crooked. And in this, she represents the human condition, beloved, without Christ. We, without Christ, are crooked. A lot of people stumble over that. Jesse had us read from Isaiah 6 this morning. Did you notice that that most righteous of people, Isaiah, said when he saw God, when he actually saw God high and lifted up, he said, whoa, it's me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And what did God say? No, 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 Isaiah, you're okay. It's no problem. Is that what he said? He didn't say that, did he? He says he took a coal and he brought it to Isaiah and he cleansed him. Because he was indeed right. The most righteous of people. We, we write it off as though we're okay because we're not criminals and reprobates, but God sees it differently. Paul said in Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 2, and he was writing to the Ephesians, he says, and you, you were dead. This is who you used to be. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's who you were. The key word here is dead. You weren't just sort of ill, functioning a little bit, but just not quite as good as you might have. You were dead. That's the chief characteristic of a dead person. No response, right? You can stick them with a pin. You could cut them with a knife. You can do whatever you want. There is absolutely no response. And that's what Paul is saying characterizes a person who is outside of Christ. He is spiritually dead. It's no wonder we think we're okay. We're not responsive to God. We're not seeing God. We're not understanding God. He's not in our vision. And so we are insensitive to his call in our life. There's no connection there's no response outside of Christ we are without hope we are crooked but we don't believe it we deceive ourselves the Bible says some of you are familiar with that verse in Jeremiah 17 9 my mother quoted it to me often the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked I'll let you guess why she quoted that to me but she she had it right. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Do you see what it said? The heart is deceitful. What it's saying there is your own heart will deceive you, beloved. Your heart will lie to you. Your own heart will tell you it's okay. You're going to make it. You're just fine. You're as good as the next person. And God is saying, no, your heart is deceiving you. You're desperately you're desperately ill. The word that's used there for desperately ill means terminally ill. It's used in 2 Timothy 12, verse 15. Remember when David and Bathsheba were in their sin and they had a baby? And that baby was very sick. And 2 Samuel 12 tells us about that. And the word that's used to describe that baby's condition is the same word that's used here to describe our heart. And that baby died because it was terminally ill. That's the word that God uses here. You are terminally ill. In case we didn't get the message there, Jeremiah 30, verse 12, he makes it very clear. Jeremiah 30, verse 12, listen. God says, for thus says the Lord, your hurt is incurable. This is how you're born, beloved. This is, this is who we are. Your hurt is incurable and your wound is grievous. It's no surprise we don't agree with God. Paul tells us why. It's like in Corinthians 4, verse 4, he says this. He says, it, it, 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. So your heart is telling you you're okay. Your mind is blind. It's no wonder you can't see that you're a sinner lost and condemned before Christ unless you come in faith to him and say, I, I accept you. You're hopeless. Just like this woman was crooked. Outside of Christ, we are blind to spiritual realities. And the result is this. Isaiah 53, 6 says it. Notice these are all Old Testament verses. The, the New Testament obviously um, gives us further indication of this. But Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. Sheep are notorious for that. They have no brains to do anything else. And they go astray if you let them. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That verse is saying is that you don't have to be outrageously evil. Society might find us quite respectable. I think we choose to you know, we choose, to, we choose to think we're okay because we're not as bad as we might be. And yet God's saying, no, you're crooked. Your condition is hopeless outside of Christ. This woman had a condition that modern medicine would probably call spondylitis deformis. Spondylitis deformis. But in, in her case, it was not just happenstance. Look, look again at verse 11. It tells us it was a result of a disabling spirit. And in verse 16, Jesus further clarifies that she has been bound by Satan. Bound by Satan. Now that's interesting. You say Satan can actually have impact on us physically. I think the Bible would say yes, this is possible. Now, we know that Satan can only go as far as God lets him go. Every time we find him in the Bible, he has to ask permission. He can only go as far as God allows him to go. But we find that he, Job, in, in the book of Job, God allowed him to bring boils. Remember the illness that came into the life of Job and the boils that came into his life. And there he was without uh, help for this infection that came upon him. Paul speaks about some kind of physical disability in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. He calls it a messenger of Satan that had come on him. Now, God allowed that. And Paul recognized that God allowed it. In fact, he says, I even know why God allowed this. We don't always get that insight. Job never did. Not in this life. Paul did. Paul said, I know why God gave me that. He said, I've had visions like nobody else have, has had. I've been to heaven and back. God didn't want me to get proud. I'm amazed these days, people that claim to have been to heaven and back seem to be very proud of the fact. Have you noticed that? Write books about it, make movies about it. If you think I'm skeptical, you're right. Paul wasn't doing that. But we see the demons can, and at times, God allows them to impose physical difficulties on people. And this woman was there. Now, she was not demon-possessed. There's no demon cast out here, but her condition was demon-imposed. She would have been an outcast to society. Why, say, how do you know that? Well, because, remember, we've seen this before in, the, in this gospel. The Pharisees, the religious rulers, believed that somebody who was disabled like that in their society was disabled because of personal sin of some kind. That was what they were taught. And so to see a woman walking around like this so severely deformed, what their, their immediate impression would have been, she's done, oh, she must have done something really awful. She was an outcast. She was crooked. And so she is, she is representative of what we are in our human condition, part and parcel without Christ. We we are crooked. And, and here's the problem, beloved. Grace cannot operate in our life until we come to a realization of who we are. Why would you ever need grace? Why would you ever come to Christ and you don't think there's anything wrong? You don't think there's a problem? You wouldn't, of course, 
until we recognize that the, that the dark heart that we have is part and parcel of our human condition, we would never come. Until we realize that the guilt that we feel before God is real and is not imagined, we will never seek a cure, but real it is. And it's been that way for a long time. David says in Psalm 51, verse 5, in confessing his, the great sin in his life before God in, in, the, in the case of Bathsheba, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. So I was, I was born this way. And then he goes even further. He says, In sin did my mother conceive me. From the moment of conception, this is who we are. David is going back to a time long before the sin with Bathsheba to recognize that this is who he was until we own the guilt that we are inherently and that we prove every day by the way that we act and think and talk and, and live. Until we own the guilt, we cannot know grace. John Stott stated it this way. He said, after God gave the promise to Abraham, he gave the law to Moses. Why? Because he had to make things worse before he could make them better. The law exposed sin, provoked sin, condemned sin. The purpose of the law was to lift the lid off of man's respectability, to close, disclose what he is underneath, sinful, rebellious, guilty under the judgment of God and helpless in himself. Listen, when we soft pedal the law, beloved, we stifle grace. Grace cannot do its work until we realize how crooked we are, until we realize that we are all spiritually suffering from spiritual spondylitis deformis. That's who we are. She was crooked. Secondly, this woman was chronic. She's chronic. What do you mean by that? I mean that there was no hope. She was bent and she could do nothing to help herself, nor could anyone else. You can believe that she had consulted the best help available in those days, but after 18 years, not only was it bad, it was undoubtedly getting worse. Her condition is permanent. There is no hope. There is no, humanly speaking, any way to get past this condition. And this is where most people stumble. They don't consider themselves spiritually lost. Even if they recognize there's a little sin in their life, they feel that they are retrievable. That somehow they can make it up. That somehow they can straighten themselves. You see, the great lesson of this passage is, no, you cannot straighten yourself. You are, you are born in sin and you are living in sin and you cannot straighten yourself. And the the heart that you have inside will tell you you're okay and you're not. The Lord tells you that you are incurable, that you are lost without this. Society will tell you that you're respectable. And God is saying, no, no, I see beyond what the society can see. I see to the murder and the greed and the lust and the, and the covetousness and the selfishness that lies in your heart where no one else can look. That's what God sees. He sees that this is not just a temporary condition. He sees that it's a permanent condition. He sees the essence of sin. Remember in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's the essence of sin, my own way, our theme song. Like Frank Sinatra says, I did it my way. And we say that in the face of God, and then we turn around and say, and by the way, I'm going to keep right on doing it my way. My way. People will say that straight out. It's because we are chronic and as helpless and as hopeless as this woman is. I did it my way. So many examples in history. Pulled one out from Voltaire. Voltaire was the French philosopher who boasted, some of you remember this, he boasted, he, he was on the front end of the enlightenment, right? The age of reason. Human reason was going to solve everything. 
And Voltaire on the front end of this said, yes, my logic, listen, the logic that I and my philosopher friends are going to bring to bear against Christianity will bury it. 50 years from now, Christianity will be forgotten. It will be destroyed. The age of reason and enlightenment and human abilities will bury Christianity. He was, he was wrong, of course. 50 years later, his house was owned by the Bible Society and they were printing, distributing Bibles all over Europe out of his own house. He was wrong. There was a French nurse who was his companion during the days that he was dying. And later on, she was called to come and attend to an Englishman who was dying. She had become noted for her skills and she said well first i have one question she said is this englishman is he a christian and she was assured yes he's a he's a he's a believer he's a christian but why do you ask and here's what she said she said well i was the nurse who attended voltaire at his last illness and for all the wealth in europe i would never see another infidel die believe me beloved unbelievers do not die well they don't they may live it up they don't die well. Did you ever see the movie Unforgiven? It's a, it's a good movie because it shows you what happens as you get near the end, as you begin to really think about things. And that's what happens to most people. And believers don't die well. Their hopelessness, their spiritual condition catches up with them. Listen, it may be just before they die or it may be just after they die, but catch up it will. Oh, the sorrow of that moment. We're crooked, and we cannot straighten up ourselves. This is the verdict of Almighty God, and beloved, it is the first step to understand grace if we don't get this. And I know we've seen it often through the Gospel of Luke, but that's because he's keep, he keeps bringing this because there still are people who don't get it. She's crooked and she's chronic, but now number three, there is hope. Mid verse 11, she's been over, could not fully straighten herself. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her. She's called. Is it good to be called? It's good to be called. Jesus called her. He looked at her condition and he called her. This is the glory of the gospel. What we cannot do for ourselves, God comes to do. When we run from him, thank God he runs toward us. This is the gospel. The gospel is you can't get there on your own, even if you thought you were trying, which you're just fooling yourself. When Adam and Eve ran from God after their sin, what was the point? The point was to illustrate this is what we all do. We run from God, and what happened? God called them. Remember that in Genesis 3? He said, where are you? It wasn't because he needed information. He's inviting them to repent. It took a while, but he got the repentance. God called them. Beloved, the call of God is so critical. And here's why. Romans 3 assures us that no one seeks God. Romans 3, verse 10 through 19. No one seeks God. No one goes after God. But God seeks us. That's the theme of Luke. Remember Luke 19, 10, the theme verse. Jesus says the Son of Man has come to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. Those who are running away, he's come to save. And so he calls. God's made a house call. He's made a house call, beloved, that cost him his own life. He's made a house call that cost him everything in order to provide for us the possibility of salvation, that call of God that comes to every life, whether we heed it or not. Jesus calls. 2 Thessalonians 2.14 is a wonderful description of this call where Paul says this, he says, to this he called you through our gospel. How do you get the call? Through the gospel. 
Don't sit around waiting for an audible voice. You get the call through the Word of God, through the gospel that's here that we proclaim week after week. This is the call of Jesus on your life. Paul says, to this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only place you can get it. It's the only way you can get it. Spiritual healing and release from guilt is not found in our merit. It's not found in the meditation of Eastern religion. It's not found in the psychiatry of American religion. It's not found in the self-help Ideas. It's not found in ritual. It's not found in spiritualism. Release from guilt, freedom from sin is found by responding to the call of God. It's found when we stop running from Him and begin to run toward Him because we've heard the call and we're responding. This is what Jesus means when He says in Revelation 3 and verse 20 to a church that had gone so far downhill that apparently he couldn't find a saved person in the whole church in Laodicea. And so he says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I'll come in and I'll have dinner with that person. Hope is knocking at the front door. The question is, are we answering the door? It's not found anywhere else. It's not found in anything else. Now, turn with me to Matthew because you need to see this. Matthew chapter 22. Just turn back two books. Matthew 22. And look at verse 14. <coughs> Matthew 22 and verse 14. Jesus says this. For many are called, it's just what we're talking about, right? Mary are called, but few are chosen. Few are chosen. What does that mean? What that means, beloved, is that everybody's called, but not everybody's chosen. It means what it says. Many are called, few are are chosen. Only those, what, what Jesus is saying there is that only those who are chosen by God before the foundation of the world will eventually respond to his call. Wow. Many are called, but few are chosen. So it's all God's choosing, but what if I'm not chosen? How do I know that I'm called and how do I know that I'm chosen? Those are great questions, beloved. Here's the answer. You know you're chosen if you say yes. You know you're chosen if you say yes to Jesus. The invitation is open. Now listen, passages like this, and this is not an unusual passage in the Bible, show us that the sovereignty of God, sovereignty of the grace and the choosing and the election of God combines with the free will of man in a way that we can, it's a mystery to us in this life. We cannot fully comprehend how, does, how do those two things work together. I don't know. But here's what I know. I know you can't do anything about God's choosing and election and whatever God did before the foundation of the world, right? You can't do anything about that, neither can I. But here's what else I know. You can do something about whether you say yes. You can do something about whether you come in faith to Christ and answer his call. And here's what else I know. You will be accountable for whether you do that or not. Jesus says in John 6, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. You must come to Christ in faith, beloved. That's what you can do. Peter says this, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he said, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent. Listen to this, be you, command. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling. How do you confirm your calling? By saying yes to Jesus. By saying yes to Jesus. That's what you'll show that you are chosen. Paul issued the same invitation. Paul, who much as anybody in the whole Bible knew all about 
God's sovereignty. Paul who said that God said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. God, is that fair? No. What would have been fair is if I hated everybody. Because everybody has gone against me. So I will choose who I will choose, but beloved, from a human perspective, and in some way that this works that we cannot fully understand, we will be responsible to God for whether we said yes to his invitation or not. If you're a Christian, rejoice in God's election. If you're not, rejoice in your free will that can say yes. Paul said it this way. He said, please, I beg you, be reconciled to God. This is your responsibility. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 18, be reconciled to God, I beg you. You can do something about this. Little four-year-old boy went to church the first time with his mom, right? And they got all seated and they went through a bunch of stuff and pretty soon the boy looked up at mom and he said, hey, hey, hey mom, when does, what, what, when does Jesus get here? What time does Jesus come? The answer to that question, beloved, is he comes when we say yes. That's when he comes. When we, by faith, invite him to be our Lord and Savior, not just the Lord and Savior. When does Jesus get here? That's up to us. She's called, number four, she's cured. She's cured. Look at the result back in, uh, back in Luke 13 and verse 12. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and he said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. Don't you love that? He didn't say to her, uh, lady, uh, what in the world happened to you? He didn't say to her, uh, lady, uh, if you, you know, I know you don't have much, but just go give that to the poor and you know what, then you, maybe, you'll get, maybe, you'll get, maybe, you, maybe you'll get freed here from this. Jesus just said, that disability you have, it's gone. It's gone. I relieve you of it. I take it away. I'm going to take it on myself in a few days on the cross. And so I release you from this disability. And he laid his hands on her, verse 13, and immediately she was made straight. Don't you love those words? She was made straight. And she glorified God. This picture, I, I, I can't do justice to this picture. The theologians of her time would have said, you want to, you're, you're, you, this has happened to you because of your sin. You probably can never get over this, but it's for sure you're going to have to, man, you're going to have to do more good things than anybody ever heard in the history of the world if you're going to have any chance to even, to even come unbended a little bit. That's what they would have told her. Not Jesus. Jesus said no such thing. He simply says the word, and then he lays his hands on her. Now listen, if you've noticed that Jesus heals people, sometimes he lays his hands on them, sometimes he doesn't. When he does, it's for a purpose. And when he laid his hands on her, what's he doing? Here's what he's doing. He is identifying with her broken condition. This is why I came. I came to identify. This is why I was baptized with the baptism of repentance. I had nothing to repent of, so why was I baptized? To identify with you and your sin. So I came because in a few days, God the Father is going to lay all the sin of the world on me and I'm going to become sin for you so that you can become the righteousness of God in me. That's what's going to happen. And because of that, I can heal you now. I will identify with your problem. Now the theologians would have been standing around, oh, don't touch her, do not touch her, you'll be defiled. But just like always, when Jesus touched somebody who was sinful, instead of him being defiled, they were cleansed. That's the power of Jesus Christ. That's the supremacy of Christ. Helplessness here has met hope, and hope wins because of the grace of God. 
What a picture. What a picture of grace. Let me illustrate with an apocryphal story. Now remember, this is apocryphal because there's going to be a piece of this you're going to have a hard time believing. Okay, it's apocryphal. I mean, it means it's not real. Guy, Englishman, he goes out and he, and he sees an advertisement for a Rolls Royce. And the advertisement says, this is the car that will never break down. This car will never break down. This guy has money to burn, and so he goes and buys this car that will never break down. And it's not two weeks he's got in the car, and he's out in the middle of nowhere, and the car breaks down. And so he calls the dealership, and he says, you know that car that never breaks down? It broke down. Now here's where you'll see that it's apocryphal. The dealership puts a guy on an airplane and sends him out there right away. And the mechanic gets out of his helicopter, and he sits down by this guy, and he looks the car over, and he begins to work on it, and he gets it fixed, and shortly the guy's on his way. Boy, he's happy. But a couple of weeks go by, and he hasn't seen a bill yet, and he wants to get this behind him. So he calls the dealer, and he says, listen, you know, my car broke down. Thank you. You guys sent this guy out there, and he was wonderful, but I haven't seen a bill yet. I'd like to get it paid. So he hears some, you know, mumbling on the other end of the phone, and pretty soon here comes the owner of the dealership on the phone, and he says, sir, we're deeply sorry but we have absolutely no record of anything ever going wrong with your car. It's a car that never breaks. That's grace, beloved. Listen. When you looked at this woman after Jesus touched her and said she was well, you'd have never known that she'd been 18 years bent over and not able to look up, you'd have never known. Because when the grace of God comes in, it does a thorough job. It cleanses. It forgives. It wipes the slate clean. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've been. It doesn't matter. I know that you've done nothing worse than killing Jesus and people who killed Jesus were later forgiven. You can be forgiven. That's grace. One more thing about her. She's crooked. She's chronic. She's called. She's cured. And boy, then what? She's captivated. She's captivated. She's captivated. But notice this in verse 13. She glorified God. That's an interesting statement because what would you expect? I'd expect it to say she glorified Jesus. Now, if she'd glorified Jesus, she'd have been glorifying God, right? But somehow, I don't know what Jesus said or did or how he got this point across, but she realized this is the power of God and she glorified God. She, this woman is now captivated. Listen, you're not going to have to worry about the fruit of repentance. It's going to happen because she's captivated by God and people who are true believers are captivated by God. Once you realize what Jesus has really done in your life, that he's absolutely cleansed you as though you never sinned. He's wiped your slate clean. Past, present, and future. When you really get that truth in your head, you're going to be captivated by God too. She's captivated by God and the fruit of, this is the first of the fruits of repentance that are going to follow her the rest of her life. She's captivated by the King of Kings. The fruit doesn't save us, but the fruit shows that we are saved. It shows that grace has arrived and we know that grace has arrived. And listen, as wonderful as the fruit is, because the fruit is wonderful, It's nothing compared to being captivated by Christ, to being captivated by God. I want to show you one more illustration in closing. It's back in 2 Samuel. So you turn there. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five. Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And then first in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 9. It's about a third of the way into the Old Testament. Here's the background. 
Israel decided they needed a king around 1050 B.C. and God gave them a king named Saul. Most of you remember King Saul. And Saul started out good, but it wasn't long before he was, before he was betraying God by going his own way, making up his own rules. And so God came through the prophet Samuel and said, Saul, I'm taking the kingdom away from you. It's not yours anymore. Saul had a son named Jonathan. David was the shepherd boy out there that came and killed Goliath for Saul. And so Saul began to like David and they formed a little relationship. But meantime, God had said to David, you're going to be the next king. So long before he ever became king, he was anointed and he knew it. And Jonathan, who was his, who was his sole friend, knew it. Even though the throne would have been rightfully his as the son of Saul, Jonathan knew that that had been given to David and they became great friends in spite of that. But Saul more and more began to hate David because he saw David being loved by the people. He saw David having victories that he could not have. And so Saul began to hate David. And the day came when Saul was killed in battle. And at the same day that Saul was killed, his son Jonathan was killed. And so the way was open for David to at last take the throne. But when David took the throne, he came to the throne and he began to ask around. And he said, is there anybody here that's a son of Jonathan? Because he loved Jonathan. And he said, I want to, anybody that's in Jonathan's family, I want to know about it so that I can honor them, so that I can pay tribute to them, so that I can so that I can remember my friend in this way, this tangible way. And he was told, yeah, there's a, there's a boy, there's a son named Mephibosheth. He's a cripple. His nurse dropped him one time when they were fleeing danger, and he's, he's been a cripple ever since. And so a knock goes out, and somebody comes to Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth you try and say that several times straight. <laughs> they knock on his door. It's the knock he's not been looking forward to. Because in those days, it would have been unthinkable that a new king would have done anything except kill all the descendants of the previous king, right? The knock comes. And they say to Mephibosheth, we want to take you to the king. And so he goes to the king. And David, when he gets there, says, you Jonathan's son? Yes, Jonathan's son. Well, then here's what I want to do. I want to give you all the land that should have belonged to you because you're the son of Jonathan. And by the way, I want you to have a permanent place at my table. I want you to live in the palace, the very place you would have been living if your father had lived. Whoa. Mephibosheth responded this way, 2 Samuel 9, verse 8. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Mephibosheth saw himself for what he was. He saw himself inherently rejected because of his relationship with his grandfather, just like we are inherently sinful because of our relationship with Adam. He saw himself as crippled and unable to be of any help, just like we are crippled by sin. He saw himself now saved because of his relationship with another, with Jonathan, just as we can be saved by our relationship with the greater Jonathan, Jesus Christ. This is grace, beloved, personified in the Old Testament, identified in the New Testament, throughout the Bible, God is giving us the same message. You cannot help yourself. You're crooked beyond hope. But I can straighten you if you just let me. Let's pray. Father, what a picture of grace. Lord, I know we haven't, haven't even begun to do justice to it. So I'm praying that your Holy Spirit would somehow have taken um, very inadequate words and applied it to our hearts. For those of us, Lord, and I pray that that's most of us this morning who have come to you in faith. And so we've experienced grace. Lord, would you just, just, just this new vision of grace, would you help it continue to motivate us to keep on producing fruit and keeping with repentance? Would you please? 
And Lord, for those few who may be here this morning who do not know you, they have never really turned their life over to you. They're holdouts. Perhaps they haven't understood grace. Perhaps they haven't understood their own sinfulness before you. Perhaps they thought they could make it on their own. They have not understood that their own heart has been lying to them all of this time. I pray that those this morning, Father, having seen a vision of who you are, having seen what you can do, having seen what grace does in operation, how we bring nothing except our crookedness and walk away straight because of the grace of God. Help them to say yes to you right now. And Lord, it's not the saying yes, it's not even saying a prayer that says I confess my sins to you. All of that's good and all of it we should do, but it's whether it's real or not. Is this coming from our heart or are we just making this up? So I pray from the depths of a heart that can only be changed by you, you would bring people to Christ right now. And because they sat here today, instead of falling on the wrong side of your wrath and heading toward the Pacific of an eternity separated from you, they will fall on the right side of redemption to spend an eternity with you. May it be so. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.